Welcome to another episode of One on One with Mitch LaFawn. Joining me this week from Guns N' Roses, or is he, drummer Frank Ferrer. Currently, though, with The Compulsions and Mule Kick. The Compulsions, of course, featuring Sammy Yaffa, formerly of the New York Dolls, Richard Fortas of Guns N' Roses, and Rob Carla. Great new album called Dirty Fun. This episode of One on One is brought to you by the Heavy Montreal Festival, taking place August 7th, 8th, and 9th at Parc Jean Drapeau in beautiful downtown Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Who do we have? We've got Lita Ford, Warren, Slipknot, Lamb of God, Faith No More, Corn, and many, many, many more. And joining me at Heavy Montreal this year to do all kinds of live tweeting, periscoping, pictures, interviews is the one, the only Mark Striegel of Talking Metal. Good day, sir. Hey, Mitch. How are you? Good, good. Uh, you know, I'm looking forward to our little Heavy Montreal uh, extravaganza you're you're going to be i think on periscope at talking metal and i'll be on periscope at mitch lafon we're going to give live video feeds of the first minute of every song from every band playing interviews and backstage stuff and uh gonna be yeah. a great time gonna be a yeah. great great time and the weather in montreal these days is is like pretty much the rest of the states we're we're in the 90 to 100 fahrenheit range so uh or, or you know, thirty to forty for for our Celsius uh, folks. It's yeah, gonna I'm hot. It's going to be sweaty. It. It's going to be hot, sweaty, and uh, as close to live as possible. We'll be you know getting stuff up on the social media outlets, like Mitch men- mentioned his social media one on one with Mitch Lafon and Facebook and Twitter and Periscope, and also on TalkingMetal.com, we'll be putting at least daily updates on that. We'll have the Spreaker page going. There'll be a lot of stuff going on, so it's going to be an exciting time, and I am uh, psyched to get up there, man. It's going to be great. It's going to be great, and we have, of course, um, uh, we're going to have some backstage interviews. Like I said, there's the media tent back there, and every so often a rock star wanders into the media tent, so we'll snag them and do some stuff live with them. And in fact, uh, I'm hoping that if we use uh, Periscope, you know, you can type in and ask questions. We can have fans type in and ask questions and have the artist answer them live. That would be kind of kick-ass if you ask me. So there you go. Uh, Frank Ferrer. Yeah. Uh, here's what the interesting thing is. is He's pretty much your neighbor, right? Yeah, I mean, that's stretching <laughs> it a little bit, but he's, you know, he's within... In the neighborhood. Yeah, he's he's less than he's uh let's see. I would say about a mile from my house, yeah. Wow. He's uh he's kind of on the other side of town, a very small town we live in. He's a great guy. I I don't see him like we don't hang out all that much, but I I would like to start hanging out with him more. <laughs> and uh I you know, it's funny my my friend Rob Bailey is good friends with him and and Rob plays in this band mule kick with frank yeah. who i hope to go check out very soon i haven't seen him yet but but rob's a, a old friend of mine and and frank yeah i've known him for a number of years now i i guess right around the time i moved out to maplewood which was around the same time he he joined guns uh, i got to know him so great guy great guy yeah and of course uh mule kick is a fun band it's sort of this uh I don't want to call it a bar band, but it's just a, a jam band, right? The guys get together and do pretty much any song for, from from Guns N' Roses to ACDC to whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, they just have an incredible knowledge of their instruments that it's, it, it, you know, they make it just seem flawless. And uh, if you haven't heard this guy, Rob Bailey, who plays in Mule Kick with uh, with frank he's such an underrated guitar player i mean he's jammed with with the guys in aerosmith uh, the guys in the new york dolls and the, does all sorts of commercials he's like a professional session musician in new york uh, has played on broadway doing like the moving out billy joel uh broadway show and he's just a, a really great guitar player and you should do yourself a treat and go see him live with mule kick yeah, absolutely. And the other band, and, and the reason for the interview, is The Compulsions, this this band that he's got with Richard Fortas and uh, Sammy Yaffa. The new album is called Dirty Fun, and that's pretty much what it is. It it sounds like a classic sort of Rolling Stone-ish 1970s arena rock kind of album. It's fun stuff. Great, great stuff. It came out a little earlier this year in April, 
uh, definitely worth uh, picking up. Uh, here's the fun thing about uh, talking with Frank. We started off talking about the compulsions and mule kick and, you know, what's going on with Guns and Roses. And just to point out, this interview with Frank was recorded a few days before DJ Ashbaugh announced that he was leaving the band, which is why we, right. don't, why we don't talk about it in the interview. Uh, but at one point, uh, Kiss came up, the wonderful Paul Stanley, Gene Simmons band known as Kiss came up. And Frank, turns out, is a huge diehard Kiss fan. And uh, the conversation became all, all about Creatures of the Night and the drum sound and Alive 2 and, and taking his dad to go see that show and what's going on here. And it almost became a Kiss geekdom festival. So uh, right. Kiss fans rejoice. If you like Creatures of the Night or, or anything about Kiss, Frank is your man, and, and the conversation is, is kiss-heavy, which um, pretty much every conversation I have has some kind of kiss in there. I guess it's one of those things, right? Right. <laughs> right on. All kiss all the time. Um, you know what? Why don't we just listen up? Here is the one, the only drummer, Frank Ferrer. We are speaking with Frank Ferrer, drummer for Guns N' Roses, and of course, The Compulsions. Uh, good day, Frank. Hey, what's up, Mitch? Thanks for having me on, dude. Yeah, you're awesome. well, very welcome. So, you know what? I, I know folks love to talk about Guns N' Roses, but let's get right into The Compulsions. That That's an interesting right. band to me. Uh, the latest album came out in April called Dirty Fun. Exactly. And, uh, you know, you have from Hanoi Rocks and the New York Dolls, Sammy Yaffa, and of course, Rob Carlyle is a singer. And you've also got uh, your... Guns N' Roses partner there, um, right? Richard Fortas. Um, the second album, right? Or you, you had Beat the Devil, I guess, in the past. Tell me right. a little bit about the compulsions. What's the, you know, where are you going with it? And then, you know, the recording of Dirty Fun and all that stuff. Right. Well, the compulsions, uh, I've been playing with, with, with Carlisle in different versions of the compulsions for well over 10 years. Um, Rob uh, um, is a, a great musician, great songwriter. Um, but in the New York scene, it's, it's difficult to keep a band together, you know, um, yeah. a lot of moving parts. So when the opportunity came up where Richard and I and Sammy were like in the same place at the same time, uh, Rob took advantage of it and got us all in the studio to record. Um, Rob writes most of the songs on his own, um, and then he'll bring like the bare bones to the band and we'll work them out. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's been it's been a lot of fun. Um, again, you know, since it's Richard and Sammy and I, uh, we're always doing different stuff and, and working. And Richard now is out with the Daisies, and Sammy's back out with with, with Michael Monroe. And we actually had had um, Alec Morton um, used to be in Raging Slab um, fill in um, the last couple of shows because Sammy's been doing his uh, TV show in Finland and playing with Michael. Right. So. Uh, um, hope, I mean, you know, when Richard come, Richard should be should some have have some downtime soon uh, with the days and other days go out back out in July, so maybe we could squeeze in another show or two. But um, up to this point, uh, the Commotion is a great band. It's a great recording band, but uh, making it a live thing has been a little challenging. So, but but we we want to continue doing it. I mean, we love the band. We love playing here in New York. We played in LA um, in April, which was amazing. You know, we had a good turnout. Yeah. Um, Del James and the gang showed up, so it's pretty good. And it's got a great sound. It's 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 very 1970s. It's got that dirty sort of Rolling Stones. Uh, oh, totally, totally. Hanoi rocks. Uh, so, is there plans to get into the uh, recording studio and do a follow up? I mean, I know this one is reasonably new, but right, right. Not... This one came out. Yeah, this one came out a couple of months ago. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, um. That's the plan. I mean, uh, there isn't anything set in stone right now, but uh, sure, man, we would, we would keep, love to keep doing the compulsion. So we would love to take it out on the road. I know Rob is exploring those possibilities right now, uh, getting out and, and playing some shows. Yeah, at least, at least, you know, at least get through some major cities in here in, uh, in the States, at least, and maybe hopefully we can find a promoter and get out to Europe too. Um, and then we'll just deal with everybody's schedule at that point. But once we have uh, something solid, then, you know, then everybody will be able to commit. Now, you mentioned the Dead Daisies, the band that Richard, right. Fortis, Richard Fortis is still in. You were on the Face I Love EP. Exactly. Uh, 
what what happened there? Why are you not on the new Revolution Revolution album? What, what? Revolution. Revolution. Um, yeah. Um, um, to be honest with you, I'm not really too sure. I know that um, when I jumped on with the Daisies, it was a very last minute thing. Mm-hmm. Um, something had happened with the drummer. I got a phone call from Richard saying, hey, do you want to come in and do the session? A uh, drummer's ill or something like that. And, uh, and I ran in and did it. Um, and it worked out great. I ended up doing that EP. And then I jumped on. They were on a, on a run um, um, in the States. But at that point, I had committed because um, it was a last minute thing I had committed to do. Because I also subbed for uh, Nana. Uh, remember Nana Nana Luckily was Nana. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I subbed that gig, and that's in Germany. Um, and they booked their gigs months in advance. So I committed to some gigs in Germany right in the middle of that tour. So I had to leave that Dead Daisies tour. I'm um, like six dates into it because I had this commitment in Germany. And then that's when Brian Tishy uh, jumped on. And I guess everything just gelled with Tishy. He's a great guy, great drummer. Um, yeah. And I guess it just continued with that, you know. So um, um, I, I think it's just a matter of like, uh, you know, um, they found a drummer that was able to commit long term um, and uh, who's a great guy and a great musician. So so I think that's, I think it's basically that's it. I don't think it's uh, anything other than that. But um, um, I haven't been asked back to play, you know, which is, which again, is not a big deal, um, but, but it's a great band. I, I love doing that EP. I love playing with Marco Mendoza. I know, I know they'll be in town later this month yeah with white snake marco yeah yeah marco called me up i was like hey we're gonna be in the city you know let's come on hang out and i'm actually playing a gig the same night on july 23rd with tommy stinson on his solo thing i just finished we just we're still recording his record but we already finished like six tracks on that record um so i'll be doing some dates later this month with stinson with tommy stinson oh, so nice. uh so hopefully i'll see marco and, and his eyes uh later this month which are you know, they should be in the city yeah, you know, let me talk a little bit about Richard Fortis. You, your relationship with him goes back years. I mean, you were in Love Spit Love with, oh, wow. um, you know, which was the Richard Butler Psychedelic Furs uh, right. side project. Um, right. What is it about Richard that makes him such a great guitarist and, and so in demand? The fact that he's with Psychedelic Furs, then Guns N' Roses, and, you know. Well, well first, first and foremost, he's like a, an amazing musician. You know? Yeah. Um, he's definitely top of the line, uh, world class musician. So that's probably the more, the best reason why he's in demand. Um, he's a he's a good man, a good guy, super reliable. Um, you know, totally depend on him a hundred percent. He has a great reputation in the industry, and um, we have a we have a we have a very good personal relationship. Obviously, we've been friends for for many many years. Um, but musically, we have a great relationship. Like I could, we, 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 we have the kind of relationship now where eye contact is all we need and we know exactly what we're thinking musically, you know? Um, and I think that's why him, him and I end up, uh, working a lot together because, um, you know, I, 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 I love bass players. Obviously I, I consider myself a group drummer, but, um, I'm a huge guitar fan. I love to play the guitar player. Like I, people always ask me, like, what's your influence as a drummer? You know? And I always say, like, Keith Richards, Malcolm Young, I was just as big an influence as John Bottom and and Charlie Drayton. You know, because um, if you could get a guitar player to play in in his comfort zone and find his the right pocket, it you know it makes it makes the rock super rock. You, you could you could dance and get up, bob your head, headbang, do whatever you want as long as you have that musical relationship and that rhythm going, that really deep rhythm. And I think Richard and I have, have um, we fell right into it. I mean, um, I remember when I went to the rehearsals for Lustre Mother in 1992, and we just started just playing and grooving, and we found like, all the right tempos for all the Lustre Love songs. It was like, it was really easy to work with him. And we, we have a special relationship musically, Richard and I. And I think that's why we end up playing a lot together. A lot of people, you know, if Rich is around, he'd be like, oh, you got to get Frank. And if, and be like, how about, you know, hey, Frank, what do you, who, who can play guitar? It's like, oh, you got to get Richard for this. It's always the same, the same go-to guy for both of us. You know? Is that what happened with, with Guns N' Roses? One of you were in the band and said, hey, you got to get this guy? It, it was, it, and Richard and I played with Tommy on his solo stuff. When okay. Tommy came through, like, you know, because, okay, so, so Richard gets in guns, him and Tommy, 
uh, become friends, all that kind of stuff. And then when Tommy came through on his some of the solo stuff, which was like, oh, you got to get Frank to play drums, obviously. So we sit down. Um, I had met um, Tommy socially a couple of times beforehand, but definitely, you know, when when, when he came to, ta- to town, we went in and did a few gigs around town, Philly and stuff like that. It was a lot of fun. And so they go off to go to the gun thing and then, um, when they find out that brain, um, his wife's going to have a baby and then wants to take a couple of days off. Uh, Tommy's pretty much the musical director of Guns N' Roses. So gotcha. he was like, when they all turned to each other, it's like, who should we get to fill in? And from what I understand, they had like a lot of big names, you know? Um, but, but those guys weren't really, you know, they didn't want to bring in somebody that they weren't comfortable with and, and that actually wouldn't be comfortable comfortable with and they knew me very well and they knew I could play the stuff you know it's just it's right up my that's my wheelhouse Guns N' Roses is it's my wheelhouse you know and uh so they were like let's just get Frank you know and it'd be fun to have him out here and he could play we know he could play this stuff yeah and it was pretty much like that it was it was a combination of Tommy and Richard um you know I had met Dizzy before um they sold it on the guys and they were like yeah bring them out let's see what happens and actually um they were in town in New York City uh, rehearsing, so it was an easy jump to SIR and and then played a bunch of songs. And next thing I know, I was out on the road with them. It was pretty amazing. It was pretty whirlwind type of thing, you know. So it was totally unexpected, um, but um, it was amazing. It was, it was is amazing still, actually. Well, you know, listen, I've seen the band in its current formation at least four or five times, and and you just fit in perfectly. I mean, it does sound great. I know a lot of folks complain about band members and stuff, but Musically, the band sounds tight. I mean, just very tight. Yeah. It's a good bunch of players now. I mean, yeah, absolutely. You know, if we were playing, and you know, if if somebody were to put this band together for like some sort of like Broadway run or something, it would be the best band on Broadway. We we, we all, yeah, we all gel. It was it's amazing. We all find each other's pockets and sit in it, and it's amazing. It's it's it's, re- it's a really really good band. You know? So D.P. Reed's piano playing is like, I mean, he's got to be one of the most underrated piano players in the world because his piano playing is insane. Okay. When we do like Houston Lover and stuff like that, it's just like, oh. I mean, it's, it's again, it's my wheelhouse. It's what, you know, I want to, you know, you know what bands do I want to be? I want to be in Rolling Stones and ACDC. I want to be in, in group bands, bands that were the drummers, you know, just sit there and just groove forever, you know, and that's what Guns is. You know? Yeah, especially the uh, the appetite for destruction stuff had a, a really oh, yeah. distinctive groove. Adler did some great, great stuff. Well, let, let's talk about yeah. a little bit about your time with with Guns and Roses because let's sure. not, let's not hide behind the you know the, the fact is is that fans love to hear about guns. Sure, um, of course. Chinese democracy was fourteen years in the making all kinds of yeah. people came in there roy thomas baker produced and then didn't produce and brian may came in play guitar and then didn't play guitar and zach wilde yeah. came in and play guitar and didn't play guitar and you yeah. know i i could i could sit here for the next 45 minutes and rattle off all kinds of names how did you uh, get brought in to the project was it because you were already on the touring band and they just said listen we got to finish these tracks well, what it was was um, okay. So, so when I first joined the band, um, and Brain sat me down and was like, "Hey, listen, these are the things that you want to think about while you're playing this music." Um, and the main thing he told me was like, "You want to take these songs and make them your own." You know, right. there's parts to them, there's drum parts to them, obviously, but uh, there's some. But you want to make it your own somehow. That's the only way it's going to work. If you are up there playing other people's parts, it's just not going to rock. You know? So I took it to heart, and at the time, um, you know, I thought it was going to be a temporary thing. I thought it was brain seat, you know. So um, especially with the Chinese democracy music, because technically, um, it's all new. I mean, not technically. It, it, at the time, it was all new music. No one's ever heard it, you know. It's one thing. I mean, I can't really stretch with the old material because there's a lot of uh, signature drum riffs in the old songs. Obviously, the Matt and 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 Adler left an imprint on guns, you know, for right. sure. You know. Right. You don't want to um, be changing. But, you could be mine because that, that's no, no. classic. And, that's, and, that, and that drum part is, is, is my, it's the most fun I have. The, the most fun song I play every night is you could be mine. I love Matt's parts. I love them. It's just, it sounds like you're changing gears in a car. It's amazing. You know, anyway. So, uh, 
So with the new stuff, I stretched more. I started stretching the new stuff more because, again, you know, um, I knew that the fan um, had never heard the material. And the, guy, and the guys, it was still new to them, so I knew that I could sneak in. Well, I don't know, sneak is not the right word. Um, I knew that I could be more myself with the new stuff, um, and I took it to heart, um, Brain's advice, and I went for it. So I changed just a couple little things, you know, um, that, that I, I personally thought would make the songs, like jump up or, or, or give it a different shift, you know, and, uh, and Axel really liked what I did. So um, when, when uh, I was called back in, um, he was like, hey, listen, man, I love those few licks you did. Um, this song, that song, kind of exactly like better and Chinese democracy, straighten it out a little bit. And then uh, he was like, I want you to put that on tape. So so when I sat down, I started recording Chinese stuff. Everything was done. Everything was completely done. Right. So um, um, so I was just I just went in and played those specific parts, you know, um, and that stuff made the record. Um, and Chinese is the only song that I played all the way through. Um, and in the other songs, it's uh, split between me and Brain and I. Um, so that's how it came to be. I mean, it, you know, my, my Axel was super supportive when I sat on Brain's chair, super supportive. He made me feel, um, welcome and part of the family. And that, again, that also made it easier for me to leave, to stretch more on the, on the newer, on the Chinese democracy music, you know? Um, and it worked out because, uh, he asked me to play on the record, I asked me to do some um, interesting parts. So. You know, you mentioned that the songs were done and that you had added some parts and Axel said, okay, I love this. We need to get it on tape. Um, why do you think they or Axel felt the need to re-record and re-record? I, I mean, if the album was done and the tracks were done, you know, why add parts? Why, what, what was what was missing? What was it? Just a vision in his head of what the music should sound like? It just wasn't complete. I, I, I guess. I guess uh, the only thing I could say is that he he wasn't ready. He just wasn't ready to put it out. He didn't feel like it was completely done. You know, I always joke and like, yeah, it, it came out. Everybody had to wait till I showed up. <laughs> I, I, I I always make that joke, but you know, obviously he he was you know. It's his baby. It was it's his baby, and he wanted it to, he wants it to be perfect. Still today, still even today, he wants he wants everything to come off just right, you know. And that's a lot of pressure to put on, on mm -hmm. yourself, and and uh, and he deals with it in his own way. Um, he is he is probably one of the greatest living rock stars in the history of music, and and they're becoming rare, as you know. I mean. You know, we, you know, think of a think of a rock star in the last fifteen years that's popped up. You can't think of anybody. You know, everybody, you know, everybody's still, you know, you know, Nine Inch Nails is still headlining festivals, and Soundgarden and Alice in Chains. It's like there's nobody out there, you know, and 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 Axel puts that pressure on himself. It's a lot of pressure. Um, he, he just wants it to be right. It's the only, that's the only thing I, I could, I could say is that he, he wants everything to be just right. You know, that's that's who he is. Yeah, which is which is and, fair and enough. That's what every artist. That's what every artist is. Every artist, you know, they're they're perfectionists in their own right. You know, very rarely do you know for every one great song you hear, they've written sixty you know songs that probably are great, but they don't feel as great. You know. Um, that's just the way. That's the way they they say. You know, he's he's he has a lot of pressure on. Um, you know. Yeah, and I think it's normal too. I mean, I've done a lot of interviews with different rock stars, and and I always say, tell me about this album or that album, and and often you'll get, oh, I wish we could go back and redo the mix. Oh, I wish we could change that guitar of part. Course. I, of I mean, course. that just it's just the nature of the beast, right? I mean, right. I mean, Zeppelin keeps freaking remastering their records. I know. <laughs> I mean, I know. Zeppelin, for God's sake. <laughs> Yeah. It's like it's like it was perfect when it came out in you know seventy one. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, by the way, the the track itself, Chinese Democracy, that you played all the way through, and I will tell you this right. as a fan, to me is as good a Guns N' Roses song as anything they had done previously. I mean, I just love that song. That song is yeah. just it is spot on. It is perfect. That's awesome. Okay, that's um, awesome. Yeah, it's, it's a great song. I, and I think, and I write Josh. I think Josh and Axel wrote that song. Here, Josh Freeze, you know, yeah, who was another drummer that was in the band. Who, who's one who of I think uh, Brain. Yeah, that Brain took over for. You know, um, I think Josh played Nails is the best band I've ever seen. I mean, I the the album when it came out didn't get. Uh, received very very well. I happen to like it. I'm I'm probably one of the few that that like it. 
Uh, the songs live, though, got received very well. You know, I've been to a bunch of shows, like I mentioned, and when Chinese Democracy opens the show or when you play If the World or any, fans are cheering just as much as anything else. Looking back uh, on the album yourself, what do you feel of the album? Did you like Chinese Democracy? I thought Chinese was great. I thought it was a great album. I'm, I'm very happy and proud to have played on it. I think it's great. Um, I think Axel singing is great. I think uh, you know Bumble's playing on it is amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, I think it's a great record. You know. Was it just that fans were expecting so much after 14 years that it was sort of destined to not be what everybody expected it to be? I mean, it was just I don't know too I don't much know anticipation. What it to be. What was that? Was, is it was there just too much anticipation? I, I don't. I have to be honest with you. I'm not sure. I mean, I know. Um, um, a lot of fans um, will, you know, they're not really open to change and to new things. A lot of fans don't let their bands take different directions. Very few bands get to have that luxury of like changing styles and changing direction. Um, You're right. Uh, I mean, essentially, only Madonna and you too have been able to. You too, right? The only one that I could think of. That, yeah, well, and like, Madonna, even though rock. that's not rock. Yeah. Right. But yeah, it's a very hard thing to to change. I mean, you know, you look at at Kiss, for example, when they do something like The Elder, and they get crapped on. Like people, right. people just don't want to deal with that. Um, the hey, question, listen, man, just just on a on a quick Kiss thing, I appreciate The Elder. You know why? Because it gave us Creatures. Yeah, and Creatures rocks. Yeah. If they don't make The Elder, they don't make a record like Creatures. They'll keep making that unmasked record over and over again. <laughs> Oh, you know what? Uh, you, you've tapped into my Kiss Geek um, <laughs> part of the. I fully agree with you that had they not made the Elder, they would not have been put in a situation where they needed to come back with something like Creatures. They might have come up right. with Unmasked Part Two or something. Oh. And so uh, you sort of got to appreciate the bump in the road, you know, to get to the beach, and and Creatures right. being the beach because that is just. For me, it's one of the top three albums. The first Kiss album, to me, is essential because they're still playing Cold Gin, they're still playing Strutter, they're still playing Deuce. Right. Uh, Creatures is pfft, wow, and then I, I I just love Revenge. I sort of like one of every decade. Um, right. I I don't you know I kind of lost touch with Kiss after around. What was that one tour that they did, like, only clubs? I saw them at the Ritz, and I saw them at Lemoore's, I think. Uh, it was, well, it was... they did a couple. To to promo Crazy Nights, they did, yeah. I think, yeah. Lemoore's or whatever. And then right. after that, to promo Revenge, they did a couple of shows in Brooklyn oh, and okay. stuff like that. But um, Yeah, no, that's, that's right, right, Crazy Nights. That's when I was like, that, okay, I have to come. I'm, I'm, but, done. I'm done with this. All right, you know what? I, I wasn't going to go down the Kiss way, but I know your the story. Okay. Your story yeah. is your dad took you to see Kiss at Madison Square Garden, right. nineteen seventy nine, I guess, the Dynasty tour. Se- right? se- no, I saw seventy seven. I saw the Live Two tour. Oh, now you're making me jealous. Okay, yeah. <laughs> um, just tell me a little bit about that night. I mean, here here it is. Your dad's taking you a Kiss show. Did did you know Kiss at all? Had the dad been playing it in the car on the eight track all day long and driving you? No, down? no, no. My my father's Cuban. He's a Latin percussionist. He didn't, he didn't speak English. Okay. No, so, he had no idea. So he how, had, how okay, did you get to a okay, Kiss okay, show? I, I love I love telling stories. Okay. So so I see Kiss on TV. Hear him on the radio. Um, my mom lets me buy uh, um, Alive um, at that point. Wait a minute. Wait, wait, hold on. It would have been. I guess by then I already would have had a couple of Kiss records. Right. Yeah, I definitely had a live. No, no, I got a live two for Christmas. So no, no. So I didn't even have a live two because it, the shows were like December sixteenth or something like that, and that's for God. So I got a live two for Christmas. So it was like another ten days before I even got that record. So, yeah. so, so, um, so no, I have a couple of Kiss records. Seen them on TV a couple of nights. You know, staying late, staying up late night, watching Don Curtis rock concert kind mm-hmm. of thing. Yeah, we um, all did and then it. I go to my dad. What was that? We all did it, right? Don Kirshner's yeah, yeah. the Paul Lynn Halloween special, uh, the Kiss so meets the, the fandom. First time, on yeah. That's the first time I physically saw Kiss. Like saw them, like actually as people on a stage was on the Paul Lynn Halloween special. Like I had no idea. Um, you know, you hear them on the radio and stuff, and 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 uh, 
you see the album covers, but I had no idea what they were like. And when I saw that, I was like, yeah, I love them, you know? Um, so, so my, so now, um, my father was a Latin percussionist, right? So we've been to a lot of shows because like every, he would go see everybody, Tito Puente, Celia Cruz, mm -hmm. El Gran Combo, and, and, and we take the whole family. It'd be us, you know, and it'd be a baile, people be dancing and stuff like that. So when I told him, I was like, hey, I want to go see this concert in Madison Square Garden. In my father's mind, he thought it was like going to see Tito Puente. So he was like, yeah, sure, we'll go see a concert. You know, my father enjoyed seeing concerts. Um, not rock concerts, mind me. <laughs> no, but, but you know so, what? He, when you think about it, Peter Chris came from that. You know, he liked the jazz and the swing and the... You know, Peter Chris's drumming wasn't so far removed from that swingy, Latin y kind sure, of, of course you know. Not. But right. Yeah, so your dad yeah, takes no, it to the not. show, and then he the, the, the curtain <laughs> drops, and his face does what? <laughs> my, my father sat there so bummed out. I never <laughs> see, I mean, I was afraid to have a good time. He was look so pissed off, and, and you know, and there's people smoking pot, and Everybody's dressed up like kids. My father, he, we came home that night and he was like, he was like, he threatened to throw my records out. He's like, you're not listening. <laughs> this is after we say it. It's not like we saw two songs and we left. We stayed for the whole show, you know, came home and was like, you're not listening to this music. This is ridiculous. It's going to lead to drugs and it's all about the devil. And he told my mom, like, when he came home, like, complaining. My mom was like, what happened at the show? I, I, I was like, nothing. It was great. My mom was, and my father goes, some dude started bleeding from his ears on the stage. <laughs> you know, and James, that's the, right. <laughs> that's the blood. Did, did he <laughs> ground you for this? No, I didn't get grounded. <laughs> By the next morning, he had settled down, you know, but he was, he, I didn't lose my records. I mean, I put all my records away. I hit it, you know, I, well, as soon as I got home, I put them all away. He was bummed out, man. But, uh, but you know, he settled down, and my mom was like, you know, relax, you know, it's just music, and, you know, you're not going to become a drug addict or something like that. He's not going to do this for a living. <laughs> a little little did know. she know, right? But, but yeah, what about but you? That night, you? You know, you, you... I remember sitting there. I remember the lights going out and 20,000 people screaming, and I remember thinking that I was going to die. That was the feeling I had inside of me. I was like, I think I'm going to die. I think, you know, it was completely pitch black and 20,000 people screaming. And I thought, I was going to, I don't know how to describe it. I, I, can't, I can't describe the feeling. But then when the, when the lights hit and the fire and the explosion, it was like, like I'm, I think I'm chasing that dragon. I think that's what I'm chasing. You know, it might have been some sort of adrenaline hit or something or made me feel this way. Yeah. And I was just like, this is, I don't know what they're doing down there, but I'm doing that. <laughs> you know? and so, you, was, you, well, you ended up doing that because Guns N' Roses, the shows I've seen with you, there, there is stuff blowing up and, you know, there's all <laughs> kinds of crazy stuff. So, so that was there's your Richard, so Richard's like, you couldn't love it. It's like Kiss 77. Richard's like, you're going love it. It's like Kiss. I'm like, yeah. That's Dude, cool. let me tell you what, though. When those freaking, those concussion bombs hit the first couple of times, Dude, I think I, <laughs> I almost got up and walked off the kid. I was like, I don't think I can sit through a whole night of these, <laughs> these things blowing up right next to me. <laughs> That's great. Did, did, you, did you go back and see them in 79 at Dynasty? Yeah, I saw Dynasty in my school. Right, that was Ron's first show, right? Yeah, right. so when I saw them in 77, Desmond, Desmond's child band opened up. Desmond, Desmond Child's Rouge or something. They yeah, it was, it was Rouge, and, right. Right, and then and then uh, um, in '79 it was that band New England. That's right. I saw New England as well. That that was great. Uh, did you know? Since you saw the '77 one, which was listen, let's not kid ourselves. That was Kiss at their prime. There was no right. denying it. That was the best sounding version of Kiss. And then you see '79, and they they do the pink outfit, and they start doing uh, solo album stuff. And I, yeah, how was? I mean, '79 was my first show, and I had the same experience as you. It, it melted my eyes and it was fantastic. And I became a rock star fan or, you know, f for the rest of my mm. life. But for you, was it a disappointment or was it just more of like, yeah, I'm no. back. Okay. Yeah, no, I love Kiss. I love, I mean, I think I could, I could tell you <laughs> that I honestly love, love Kiss 
probably all the way, like I was saying before, like cra- until until crazy nights. Obviously, you know, after Asylum and stuff, I was like, ah, they've gotten a little popish. And, mm-hmm. um, and even though at that point I'm already into like, you know, Soundgarden and Nine Inch Nails and those kind of bands, mm-hmm. I still I have a, like a love affair with kids. Like a, and I, I still kind of do. Like I got, you know, you come to my house, I got all the action figures out and Christmas balls and you know there's a, there's a loyalty. <laughs> I got all my all my programs you know i got all my kiss programs i i, I had the 77 one i still have pictures of the 77 one but what happened was that i you know i was a little kid so i cut them up I, I took the program apart and hung it on my wall you know so i ruined it but i but i i, I have the 79 program i have all the programs from every show i've ever seen Ah, oh, that's great. Did um, I had the program with Mark St. John on it, right? Which is that one? 84, um, Animalized. Animalized. I had I had that program, and then I had, I saw them like two or three times on that tour, and I have a Bruce Kulick one of that program, too. Man, you, you have a uh, eBay fortune sitting in your closet. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> did you see the 1980 Unmasked, not Unmasked, well, it is Unmasked, but the Palladium show in New York? I saw the Palladium show. Yeah, I was actually at that show. So that yeah, yeah, was, I saw that show with the Rock Cats, right? Didn't the Rock, Rock Cats? Open up. You got it. That yeah. was that was yeah. a great. They were they're great. I've seen them. I've seen them. You know, years down the line, and they're they're slamming. They they were they were probably better than the Stray Cats, but they didn't get any uh any, any love. You know, I know. Hey, but hey, who knows? Maybe we met each other on that July twenty fifth, nineteen eighty. But. Uh, Okay, let me ask you, since you're a drummer... Just, just, just real quick, and, you know, the Palladium was great because I lived on 16th Street and 9th Avenue, and the Palladium was 14th and 3rd. I literally would walk out, out right outside the door of my, of my apartment building that I live on mm-hmm. because the bus, the 14th Street bus, the first stop is 16th Street. It used to be 16th Street and 9th Avenue that will make the right and go down 14th Street. So I would walk right out my door, get on the bus, take it all the way down to 14th Street, and then after the show, cross right directly across the street from the Palladium and take the bus right back to my mom's house. Oh, wow. No, I we, love the Palladium. I saw Saxon there, oh, wow. Triumph. No, I we, love, I Canadian, love the Canadian there. band Triumph. No, the, uh, the, uh, the Unmasked show, I had to uh, convince my mom that it was worth going to drive down from Montreal, uh, buy tickets from a scalper for 35 oh, bucks, yeah. Which listen, back in 1980, 35 bucks was like paying a million dollars for a ticket. Um, right. And then, I mean, that that, that was a effort. But uh, to my mom's credit, she made the trip. She got a hotel. She got you know. She drove the car. She, Jesus Christ, she, that's she, amazing. She made the effort. Like you guys went down. Your mom took you down without even having a ticket. No, no ticket. We went to a, a broker in New Jersey. Uh, we saw an ad that you know somebody was selling tickets in New Jersey, and we, w- but hey, we ended up with uh, center seats, row T. I remember very clearly. Wow. So, so you know we were like whatever twenty rows back, but dead center for the unmatched show. It was fantastic. And, and and you know at the Palladium, like so they're still they're like you know, it's like sitting you know first row at Madison Square Garden, you know, because mm-hmm. it's like there's a great venue to see that. I mean. One band that went to the Palladium that I had a chance to see and did not go see was AC Bond Scott Highway to Hell Tour, dude. And I didn't go. ACDC at the Palladium? Oh. <laughs> Bond Scott. Because they did, when they went, when they came through with uh, Hell's Bells, the, the Back in Black Tour, they, they opened up for Ted Nugent at the Garden and headlined the Palladium. They, 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 I think ACDC really? was actually. I think they were opening up for like Molly Hatchet or some crazy band, but it was, I mean, ACDC was popular in New York City because they were considered more of a punk rock band in New York City. For some reason, they had more of a punk rock swag, like they play CBGBs and stuff, you know. Um, um, but but I, I had a hey, you know, ACDC got tickets, blah, blah, like ah, you know, I can't can't go. I'm surprised that they know. weren't a much bigger band by by Back in Black, but. Uh... Huh. Well, and yeah, back in black, they headlined the Palladium and opened up for Ted Nugent at, at, at Madison Square Garden. I'm back in black. Wow. Wow. Isn't that uh, crazy, dude? Yeah, the, the biggest record ever. The good old days. No, yeah. I saw Ted Nugent on that tour, but I think we had like April Wine or Toronto or one of those Canadian bands open right. for him up here. Oh. Uh, since you're a, a drummer, 
and you're a big yeah. Kiss fan. How, how do you rank, or how do you? I don't want to say rank. How do you qualify Peter's Peter Chris is playing, Eric Carr is playing, and Eric Singer? I, obviously, you're more familiar with Peter Chris. Just right. good drummer, um, average drummer. You know, soundtrack oh, wait, to your wait, life. Peter Chris? Yeah. yeah. No, dude. You know, um, I I. It's, okay, first, I just want to say, just in general, it's hard for me to, to really, like, kind of rate drummers, compare drummers, um, but any drummer, I mean, any drummer will be lucky or, or, or blessed. Like, God will come down and put his finger on you if you get to play a song as great and as popular as rock and roll on, like, part of the day, mm -hmm. or, or, or Surrender, or, or Brown Sugar. Or you know, or November Rain. Any drummer, any drummer will want to play on one of the greatest songs ever. Right. So, you know, that makes you an immortal dude. Yeah. I don't care if you, if, I don't care if you're the shittiest drummer playing in in every club. If you get to play on one of the greatest songs ever, if you get to play on, you know, I want to hold your hand, or, or you know, you know, Welcome to the Jungle. You, if you get to play on an immortal song, that makes you an immortal. Peter Chris is, is an immortal. As far as I'm concerned, Bunny Cardo, Carlos, you know, Phil Rudd, those are untouchables. Those are the guys that I want to be like. So, regardless of whether Peter Chris could play, you know, you know, you know, any Rush tune or any like, you know, you know, jazz and whatever, whatever you want to say, he got to play on some of the greatest songs ever recorded. So he's an immortal for uh, sure. I agree. You know, and you know what? Technical proficiency doesn't make you. A great player. I mean, you look at, for example, C.C. DeVille in Poison. Not the greatest right. guitarist in the world. Can't run scales like Steve Vai or whatever. But man, when you hear nothing but a good time or talk to her, those are just fun songs. And he plays the perfect parts for those songs. I mean, that's what it's about. It's about playing for the song and not jumping up and down and saying, look at me drum and do some fills. It's like, well, who cares? Yeah, no. Who cares? It's, 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 it's about the song. Yes, Everybody absolutely. remembers the song. Yes. That's it. That's it. Yeah, and that's why when you and, look and that's a mark of a great drummer. That's a mark of a great drummer. Knowing what to do on a great song, recognizing that a song is great and it just needs this and that, and it doesn't need, you know, four breaks in it. So I could do my my super quadruplet, you know. Yeah, nobody cares fiddle. about that. It doesn't. It doesn't need it. Yeah. What was that? Uh, nobody needs that. You don't need Peter Chris yeah. saying, "Wow, well, during rock and roll all night, I need some blast beats," and it's like. No, you don't. Yeah. <laughs> Just play for the damn song. Blast, blast yeah, can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> right in the middle of right in the middle of rock and roll uh, all night. That, that'd be a, that'd be yeah. something. But and, and as far as Bunny Carlos, what he did with uh, "Ain't That a Shame," that opening, I guess drum riff yeah. for the lack of a better word, fantastic. It's fantastic. Um, I mean, I, and I know I know there was like something on the internet or Twitter that that Matt Storm got some shit for November eight. I mean, dude, I. I would have loved if they would if they would tell me like, hey, you get to, to record November Rain, um, but you got to play these drum parts. I'd be happy as hell to play those drum parts because it's a great song. You get to play on a great song, you know. It's just it's it's. I don't. I mean, to, to be honest, with you, I, I I don't really get that whole comparing musician thing anyway to begin with, because um, I don't know where this whole sports competitive thing comes into play in music, in art. It makes no sense to me, so I don't really buy into it. So it's mind boggling to me. I just want to play on a really goddamn good song, man. That's all I want to do. And if and if all I'm doing is playing four on the floor and not anything else, and I get to play on a great song, man, I'm I'm happy. <laughs> I'm ecstatic. You know. Well, all right. Let, let's not compare then. Let Let me just ask you this: one more kiss, one, then I'll I'll get back to the compulsions and 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 guns. But <laughs> but you mentioned creatures of the night. It is considered by fans of the band and just rock fans in general to have one of the best sounding drums, the best drum sound for an album. Uh, when, as, as somebody who had a dad who was a percussionist, as a drummer yourself, when you hear Creatures of the Night, does it just make the, the hair on your arm stand up? Um, I remember buying Creatures and putting it on my record player and believing that it wasn't even Kiss. Like, I kept listening to these songs, and other than Paul and Gene's voice, I'm like, this is not, this is, this, this doesn't even, it didn't even, at, to that point, it didn't even sound like it. It was such a leap 
a huge leap sound-wise, um, um, songwriting-wise, that I, 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 I was so happy that that record was out. I felt for sure Kiss was back, you know? I mean, I mean, it was, I mean, yeah, at the time, and I haven't heard Creatures in, in years, right? But I remember at the time, after Unmasked and after um, The Elder, yeah. not knowing what to expect from, not knowing at all what to expect from Kiss. And then hearing that version of Kiss, it was, it was amazing. It was great. Yes, I, I, I loved that record. I loved that version of Kiss. I loved it. You, you know what I hated about that record, though? I do hate one thing about that record. What is that? I don't know what it is. I yeah. bet you you know what it is. Um, when they changed the album cover. Yeah. In 85, what? and they put the Bruce Kulick album cover, you went, what the heck is that? What, what the hell? Why? 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 But they brought it back. They 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 made up for the mistake on the remasters and all that stuff. But uh, yeah, that was just very very strange. I I would the only thing I could ever think of is that it must have been some kind of lawsuit over the makeup, and they figured, well, the hell with it. We'll just change it. Oh yeah, I didn't even think about that. That's right, because it's already right. Ace was already out of the band at that point, right? Well, Ace was out of the band and Vinnie Vincent had just uh, dropped out of the band. He had done the, the you know, lick it up and stuff and and he played right. a little bit on creatures. Uh so they they who knows. You know, sometimes yeah. we don't understand why things are going on, but uh, behind mm -hmm. the scenes is all kinds of nonsense and maneuvering and legalities and um, right, right. Let me get you back to Guns N' Roses for a second, because so we've sure. we've we've gone long here, and and um, <laughs> and, and I know fans are interested. <laughs> the question that you keep getting asked over and over again, and I don't even know if it's relevant at this point, is: Is there going to be a new Guns album? Well, the the, the best way to answer that is that Guns has a, a, a future. Guns definitely has a lot of movie parts, and there's a lot of things in the works. And uh, once uh, you know, we're ready to announce something, you know, um, the whole world will know. Um, um, but everything is moving forward. Everything is going in a, in a pace, but it's, it's moving forward. Um, after the last show in, uh, what day was it? When was that? Uh, 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 2014. The Vegas, the Vegas show, June 7th, 2014. Right. Richard, yourself, did the Dead Daisies. Uh, Bumblefoot went off and did his stuff. Tommy went back to the replacement. It seemed as though everybody scattered. Um, there was a suggestion that the band just didn't exist anymore. Is that somewhat accurate? Did, did the band sort of disintegrate and disband? Is, is Are you still a member of Guns? Yeah, I, I don't think that's accurate at all. Yes, I am a member of Guns. I, I speak to, to um, Axel and I text all the time. You know, he's uh, but yeah, I am a, a member of Guns, and, and Guns still exist. Yeah, for sure, hundred percent. I okay. mean, uh, um, er everybody, as, as far as I know, so far as you know, as at this moment, you know, everything is is the same, and everybody's in, and um, you know, and we're moving forward. And, and, and you know, listen, I know some of these questions may might be a little uncomfortable, but people want want to ask. Um, there's a lot of suggestion that 2017 being the 30th anniversary of Appetite for Destruction will finally be the reunion tour. Um, what, what are your thoughts about that? Have you heard any grumblings about there's going to be some kind of, of reunion tour? Yeah, in I, I honestly don't, don't know anything about that. There's, as far as I'm concerned, uh, there isn't anything like that in the work. Okay. As far as I know. So, so, um, um, you know, I mean, Jesus, 2017, God. <laughs> I know, it's a couple of years down um, the to road. To be honest with you, I haven't, I haven't thought about that at all. You know, I mean, I know um, um, everybody's working towards the next, um, you know, chapter in the Guns N' Roses book. So I, I don't know, I don't know um, anything about that. And I would, I would assume that if anything like that is happening, you know, I probably wouldn't be a part of it anyway. Right. So, or no one would tell me about it at this point. So, right. um, um, I can't, I don't know what's going on in 2017, but I know what's going on now. And um, as, as of right now, we have to stand still moving forward. Still moving forward. Okay, so then let me ask you this, and, and we'll move on from Guns N' Roses. When is your next show with Guns N' Roses? As of right now, we don't have anything to book, but I'm, I'm hearing rumors 
that there's probably might be stuff like um, towards the end of uh, this year, beginning of next year, but that's nothing we've worked as of yet. Oh, that'd be kind of cool. Um, yeah. That, okay, so there you go. Uh, and for back to the <laughs> Yeah, you got to ask, right? The fans want to know. No, it's, it's okay. It's, it's okay. I get it. You know, um, um, you know, I, I I appreciate how much everybody adores GNR, and I, I appreciate how important it is. And um, and again, as soon as we have anything solid, man, you know, everybody's gonna know right away. So. Yeah, and if if you got to making a another album, um, what what kind of you know what kind of release would you like it to be? Would you? more old school or would you try to try to explore new territory what what would you like a new guns and roses album to be like i think i think uh the um you got me on that one that's a pretty tricky one um <laughs> it is. I, I think i think guns <clears throat> is always gonna evolve i think guns is always gonna go forward i don't think um rehashing the past is any part of Guns N' Roses at all. Right. Um, I really do think that um, the way, uh, you know, DJ, the kind of songwriter DJ is and, and Richard and stuff, um, I don't think, I don't, I don't think capturing, I think it's, it's just going to be more of a continuation going forward. It's going to be more, it's going to grow more. I mean, you know, I'm a different player than, than, than Steven and, and Matt and Brain. Um, you know, everybody's different musicians. You know, Tom's a different bass player. I think it's just it's gonna it's just gonna evolve into it's going it's gonna be more 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 Chinese democracy ish in that vein, as opposed to uh, older the older stuff. Older stuff. You know, but I mean, but you know, you know, the constant is Axel's voice. That's 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 what you're gonna hang on to. That's what you're gonna hear. That's what you're gonna latch on to. Is that classic voice so in that sense yeah that's gonna you know that's gonna be constant that's gonna remind me of everything of the whole gnr catalog you know yeah and he's still got it he's still got it going on and then uh i guess i'll, I'll finish with this he, axel and guns for many years in the early 2000s would start shows late 11 o'clock 11 30 sometimes you never knew the last couple of years it seems that 10 o'clock everybody was on stage um, yeah, yeah but what people seem to forget about is the fact that when you hit the stage, regardless of what time, you would do about 37 songs, you know, three hours, sometimes four hours. Um, as a drummer, that, that is physically challenging. Um, you know, was that hard on you to do those exceptionally long shows? And, and... It, it, took, it, took me, it took me a minute to figure out the pacing of shows. Mm -hmm. um, it did, I, I did have um, like the, obviously the first couple of shows or the first, the first, you know, actually a couple of shows, probably the first tour I did with guns, uh, like the rest of that European tour when I sat in for the brain, um, I was like so amped and excited to be on there that I was, I feel sometimes that I would just like let it all out in the first half of the show, you know, um, I've become, um, a much better drummer since then, obviously, as far as pacing stuff goes. And, you know, this place is, I mean, even though I play on all the solos, you know, mm -hmm. there's places where, where as a drummer, um, physically I can catch my breath and, and rethink things, you know, stuff like November Rain and, and, um, um, Don't Cry the way Bumbles does it. So there's parts in the set that I could catch, you know, my breath and, and, and sit within myself and kind of like a little meditation of getting geared up back for the second half of the show. So, um, I've learned how to pace myself for sure. Um, but yeah, no, I, at first it was that very difficult. I didn't know what to expect, but, but when I first joined the band, um, all the solos, um, you know, cause Robin would take a solo, Rich would take a solo, Dizzy would take a solo. So all the solos, um, I didn't have to play on. So during the first run with them, I would just, sit up, come off the riser and sit back, sit back behind the riser and able to rest for a second. Um, but now I play on all the solos. So, um, so you never I, get a I, break. I have, I've learned to, to pace myself really well. So, so now it's not difficult at all. Now I love, you know, now I love never getting off that, 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 that seat yeah. um, on stage. Love it. And I, I gotta say, if he came on at 11 or 1130 and did 10 songs, 55 minutes and left, I could understand folks criticizing, but 
when you come on, even if it's at 11 and you do 37 songs, at some point you got to say, hey, give the kid a break. I mean, come on. He, at least he's giving you money for your, for your, you know, value for your money, right? I, that's what I tell everybody. I'm like, you're like, yeah, you know, not anymore, thank God, but when you had to wait for him to come on. First off, you knew that was going to happen on Dubai. You know that's going to happen. That's well, you me. should, that's yeah. Who he is. And then, and then she's going to let it all hang out. Because when he's ready to hit, he's going to hit. You know what I'm saying? He, he makes sure that he's 100% on point. And then the band rises to his level. So that, so you get a great show every time. You know, you get a sick show, you know. Yeah. And, and I got to say, that show at the Montreal Metropolis, uh, which I guess was a year or two ago, um, it was like from 10 to 2 in the morning. And it was ju- it was one of the best shows I have ever seen. The the, the small was that venue. The club one was that, that club? Yeah, the little club one in yeah, Montreal yeah. at the Metropolis. It was. Dude, there was like a hundred and sixty thousand degrees in that club. Yep, bro. it was. It was exceptionally. <laughs> uh, listen, I must have lost twelve pounds just in sweat that <laughs> night. But you couldn't have asked for a better show. The the song choice was great. The pacing was great. That the effects were yeah. great. The crowd just. 2,500 people jammed into a club that only seats 2,000. Don't tell the fire marshal. But uh, it, it was it was, it was, was just what rock and roll was supposed to be. And perfect, perfect, perfect show. And let me tell you something. I, I love, obviously, the stadium rock. And, you know, every time we play one of those big outdoor festivals, you know, it's like, you know, Kiss 77 for me, obviously. Right. Um, but man, there's nothing like getting in a club and just and blowing the roof off of a club. I mean, I'm still in my soul, deep inside my soul, a club punk rockish type of drummer, you know. And to be in there, I mean, to be in those type places that you could see everybody in a big stadium shows, you can't see everybody. But like in, in a club, you could see it. You could look all the way in the back, and that dude in the back is losing his mind. And it's just like, ah, it's just a great experience. We did that run. We did like the Brooklyn Bowl in New York and the uh-huh. Hero Ballroom. And it was just like, you know, and, and, and then the guy in the back of the room and those shows are friends of mine, you know, <laughs> people that I, I didn't know that guy. <laughs> it was like, it's, it's awesome. I, I love doing uh, the smaller venue shows. just love them. It's just more fun for me as a musician. It's a yeah. lot more fun. Oh, they're great. And then, of course, uh, since you're doing, uh, we're talking club shows, you do Mule Kick with uh, Rob right. Bailey, Rob Clores, right. and Brett Bass. Um, yeah. Only in New York, or is that going to tour at some point? I think... Now, now these, these are all guys that are in the same boat as I am. You know, they're working musicians, and, and we've been able to have a pretty good run. Everybody happens to be home at the same time. Everybody has a, a little bit of downtime at the same time. So we got together to do this thing. It, we, you know, we play covers. It's not an original music band, but we definitely want to do more shows. Um, as of right now, we just have a residency at the Beast of Bourbon in, uh, in Best Buy, Brooklyn. Um, and that's Tuesday nights. Uh, we might stretch that into a Manhattan night uh, come the fall. So we might be doing two nights a week. Um, and it's a gig, and it's a gig that we sub out, you know. So I, I, you know, I've been away already a couple of times and they've had a drummer sit in and and uh, the keyboard player is away now. We have, you know, we sub the keyboard. It's a, it's a subbing gig. So um, at any given time, you might not see all the original guys in it. But it's something that's going to continue, you know, when, when guns starts back up again, um, you know, I'll have somebody sitting in that seat. And then when, when we come home from a break or something, I'll be sitting on that seat. Well, as of right now, it's not a... Um, it's nothing more than, you know, a bunch of guys getting together playing their favorite songs. You know, we get to play Surrender and all the songs I'm talking about. You know? um, so um, as of right now, it's, you know, if you want to come to see it, you should, I mean, first off, you should come to see it. You get a chance because it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And guys are insane players, you know. Chloris used to play with the Black Crows. Black Crows and yeah. Brett Bass is like this, like this young kid from Texas, but he has like this old funk soul. And so, you know, he's playing with Bernie Worrell and plays old, old blues type of thing. And Rob Bailey is a session guy here in the city. Uh, we've done stuff with uh, Steven Tyler and David Johansson and stuff. And, um, you know, it's just like a bunch of great players playing, you know, oh, we're all kids fans <laughs> playing music that, you know, that we, love you know and just playing it just for fun and you know and for chops you know i mean it's, it's definitely a thing where i get to stretch more i play a way 
way more than I do in any band that I play in right now. <laughs> you know, I'm just like, I'm just letting loose. Yeah, I got, so I got to get just, out and see that. Right now, it's just a fun thing to do, you know. Yeah, it's a, and of course, uh, there's a Facebook page for it for folks who want to. It's a Mule Kick NYC on Facebook if you want to go check that out. Frank, yeah. great pleasure. Uh, I know we we geeked out on Kiss a little bit, and that wasn't the plan, cool. but it, that, you know that's that's what Kiss does to people, right? It yeah, yeah, makes you stop I mean, in your tracks. It's like a rite of passage. It's like you know, some kids like I had to join a gang. Other kids are like you know, you know, I had to become a uh, uh, you know, you know, oh. uh, what do you call it? Uh, you know, I had to work in a church or become a you know a minister. You know, it's a rite of passage. We had to go through Kiss. You know? Yeah, we joined we, the we Kiss Army. Rock, we had to go through Kiss. The Kiss Army is is alive and well, and and still going strong in 2015. So there you go. Uh, yeah. Great pleasure talking to you, Frank. Yeah, great talking to you, Mitch. Thank you so much for your time. It's awesome. Oh yeah, and and by the way, you know, plug my uh, Twitter, you know, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, it's what it's at Frank Ferrer sixty six. six. Yeah, uh, Twitter um, and Instagram are both at Ferrer sixty six. And my Facebook page is frankferrerofficial.com. There you have it, my interview with drummer Frank Ferrer. The new band is The Compulsions with Richard Fortas of Guns N' Roses, Sammy Yaffa of Hanoi Rocks, New York Dolls, and Rob Carlisle. The new album is Dirty Fun. The first album that came back uh, out in 2011 is called Beat the Devil. Check both of those out on Apple Music, iTunes, uh, which I guess is the same thing, Spotify and wherever else you listen to your music. And of course, this is brought to you by the Heavy Montreal Festival taking place August 7th, 8th and 9th at Parc Jean Drapeau in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, Corn, Faith No More, Slipknot are your headliners. And the bands I'm there to check out are going to include Extreme Warrant, Dokken and Lita Ford. Mark, always a pleasure. Yeah. And, and don't uh, forget, you, you're going to have Frank coming back on to co-host some episodes, right? Yeah, I've got a, uh, a nice Kiss interview coming up, and uh, I'm going to have Frank come on and, and co-host. And speaking of drummers that are co-hosting, uh, I just want to give a shout-out to Johnny D of Brittany Fox. Uh, he's done a couple of episodes while he's out on the road with Doro, you know, the, the Rudolph Schenker and others. Just a great, great guy. Great chat, great conversation great input um very much looking forward to having him uh, co-host a few more episodes and uh, maybe get out there and catch a britney fox reunion show yeah i thought he was great as a co-host and i couldn't believe when you told me he was you know in europe because it sounded like he was sitting in the same room as you yeah he was in a in a hotel room in germany on a wi-fi connection and you could have sworn that we were sitting in an fm radio station somewhere yeah, great stuff. Great, <laughs> great stuff. Great stuff. Uh, don't forget, of course, Frank also has Mule Kick, which is uh, funny because as we are actually taping this today, uh, Mule Kick has a show. Uh, so that's why Frank couldn't come back on and give us a few extra updates on the whole DJ Ashbaugh thing because he's currently playing with Mule Kick. So that's, uh, that's always fun. Uh, Mark, what do you got coming up on Talking Metal? We just posted a great interview with Blasco today. Uh, I have an episode that you and I recorded like probably over a week ago at this point that I need to get up, which I hope to do this week uh, with uh, Cole Chamber. And uh, let's see what else I'm trying to think. Uh, a couple of the pop evil coming up and, of course, Heavy Montreal. So good stuff on the way. Yeah, Heavy Montreal is going to be great. Uh, for those for the fans that like to check out one on one after Frank, we've got. Aerosmith, Tom Hamilton, an interview coming up that are that's already done and ready to go. Marco Mendoza of the Dead Daisies also played with White Snake and Thin Lizzy. Eric Turner of Warrant is coming right up. Uh, who else? Yes is coming up, and Chris Caffrey talking about uh, you know Trans Siberian Orchestra and all kinds of stuff he's involved with. So a lot of great interviews coming up. Keep listening to One on One. Keep checking in talkingmetal.com. Find me at, at Mitch Lafon And Mark, where can we find you? Yeah, the Facebook is probably the best place, which is facebook.com slash M Striegel. That's M S T R I G L. There's also a Talking Metal Facebook page, which you can like and you can get updates and stuff there. Yeah, and you can, uh, I guess, uh, join me on my Mitch Lafon Facebook and watch people debate the merits of kiss on a daily basis <laughs> yeah <laughs> which is pretty much it but hey got to love it at least people are paying attention yeah. thank you mark 
Good stuff. Thanks, Mitch. Talk to you soon. Always a pleasure.